Hi, and welcome to another episode of Inspiring Business. My name is Mark Bullock, and I'm the co-founder of PhoneBlogger.net, VideoSocials.net, and Video Interview Podcast Services, where we facilitate marketing services and systems for professional service firms, including attorneys, financial professionals, coaches, and consultants. Every episode, I interview business thought leaders who make a difference in the world through their services, their products, or their ideas. You can find the show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and more. Today, I'm excited because my guest is my friend and longtime client and Video Socials member, Sean O'Rourke, who is a cyber liability consultant at Combs and Company. Welcome, Sean. It's great to have you. Thanks, Mark. It's, uh, thanks for having me, and it's a pleasure seeing you. Terrific. It's good seeing you as well. So um, cyber insurance, I mean, that's got to be just an immense field and, and something that is, has come to the forefront in, in the last several years. Um, but what role do you see cyber insurance having in business and, and how does that differ from, you know, even five, 10 years ago? So uh, depending on which historian of insurance you talk to, and believe me, there are actually some people who do that, okay. uh, cyber insurance has been around for almost 30 years in one wow. form or another. It wasn't called cyber back then. Back then it was called computer um, insurance. And um, But like all insurances, it's just like technology, uh, as you and I have seen over the various decades, it's evolved Mm. into what it is today. And essentially, cyber insurance is what protects you should you have something, an incident of some sort. Think ransomware, think of phishing attack or um, a fraudulent transfer, Mm -hmm. uh, a scam. Uh, perpetrated on your business. It's the insurance and insurance carriers have now designated for those types of incidents. Um, They've tried to carve out as much as possible from general liability, property, uh, even errors and omissions or professional liability, anything that has to do with cyber, because they want to try to silo that risk off as much as possible so that they understand where their exposure lies. And as you said, the last two plus years have definitely opened their eyes, the insurance carrier's eyes, that is, to their exposure through these policies. And so the cyber market is much different um, today than it was, let's say, March 10th of 2020, um, and definitely much different than it was in 19, 18, 17, uh, or so forth, when it was very easy to get and what I thought artificially inexpensive. And I've uh, had the pleasure of having you in video socials meetings and recorded, recording the videos that you've recorded that you make available for free for uh, those who want to watch. And uh, so many times it's like um, uh, the feedback from, from other members and, and from myself is that, you know, you, you scare the crap out of us. Um, and. And at the same token, uh, you are providing solutions. You're providing, you know, providing a path forward. Um, and and many times, and I've seen you, you know, go on such topics as, you know, making sure that when you're filling out an application, that you actually know the answers to the questions and that you're giving accurate information because this isn't a, a pull the wool over the eyes of the insurance company, either intentionally or unintentionally because that could put you in a position where you're not going to be covered when you think that you are. Um, and, Mm -hmm. and, and so I see you as a, really a consultant, somebody who can, who can help people look at what their situation is, what they need to, to ensure themselves from what they need to, what risks they need to mitigate with insurance. But it actually is a is a broader perspective because there is, you know, what we do to actually protect ourselves, and and, and whether that be you know firewalls, whether that be uh, malware protection, et cetera, et cetera, um, how we utilize our computers, what our policies are 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 in place for 
those that uh, are using or involved mm -hmm. in our company and 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 how their computers are connected to the internet and how they're transmitting data, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a huge, huge field. And I, I guess that, that brings me back to the next question is, is it, because we both have a similar background in technology, but how, how did, what was your background in technology and how did that lead into you settling into and becoming a cyber liability consultant for an insurance company. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if your viewers know that about you, but prior to your current role, you spent years in technology. Um, I did the same. And the last 12 of which I was a co-founder and president of a, a managed service provider, which is basically an outsourced chief technology officer, outsourced whatever you needed from a technology perspective um, for companies. And uh, in 2016, I just, I had had enough of that lifestyle. It is a, it's beyond 24 by seven. It's a millisecond by millisecond in, uh, lifestyle because you just never know when you're going to get that notification that something has gone awry with one of your clients. And so I decided to go seek uh, a different opportunity. And at that point, my wife, who is the founder and president of Combs and Company, uh, needed some new systems in place because of the way her business was changing. And so she said, hey, you're not going to be doing anything. So come on over and help me. And I figured, you know what, that'll be a couple of weeks. That'll be good. I'll get a little bit of time to decompress and then then figure out what I wanted to do next. Well, um, I guess that was six years ago at this point. And uh, apparently cyber insurance is what I chose to do next. And one of the reasons why is that it kept me connected to technology without having to take care of the technology, first of all. Another reason is that what I realized is that the, the real damage done by a cyber incident is not done via the IT side or the technology side. It's done because the business side is not prepared to respond to the incident in the way that they have to respond. Uh, and the last decade has seen a lot of changes both in, in state law, regulatory law for certain industries, federal law, even international law that a, a lot of companies don't realize that they may be subject to. And so what was happening is, is that the business side was thinking, hey, that's an IT problem. And so they were pointing at the IT folks saying, it's your problem. And then all of a sudden, lawyers, regulators, and other folks come knocking on the door saying, hey, you had some sort of incident. My client or my citizens were impacted by that. You are now on the hook for, for something. Um, you know, what that something may be a lot of times has to go through a whole sort of legal machinations. And um, what was happening is, is that the what they were finding out was that the IT was set up OK or pretty good um, and even sometimes really good. But the business side wasn't. Uh, the business side had no policies or procedures. They had no documentation. They had no employee training. Uh, they had uh, essentially a free for all when it comes to uh, the technology or, again, that's an IT problem. And what they were finding out was the repercussions of a cyber incident are not an IT problem. It's a business problem. And so that's my role now. My role is to work on the business side of the house to essentially prepare them to be hacked. Uh, instead of trying to prevent it, because there's there's a new reality. It's a, not a matter of if, but when you are going to experience some sort of cyber event. It's going to happen to every business. It's going to happen to every individual. And how you mitigate the damage is inversely proportional to how much you prepare ahead of time. So now that's my role. And cyber insurance is one of those tools to help keep the stone from rolling all the way downhill and crushing the villagers and whatnot. 
Uh, I can make a Superman the movie reference, but I'm not sure how many people in your audience are old enough to remember that movie. But um, uh, what you want to do is, is basically you're trying to protect yourself with insurance, but you still got to do the right things uh, per se. And the last two and a half years, the insurance carriers have now started to do that to make sure both the business side and the IT side of the house are taking steps to protect themselves. So uh, along those lines, and, and again, you know, my uh, my experience, you know, uh, is is it was a number it was a number of years ago, but you know, I was in some of the upper enchilons on global networks um, and and some banking systems, et cetera. Um, and and back then we were concerned about you know intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, firewalls. Uh, uh, antivirus, uh, anti-malware, you know, these types of things. And, and the biggest issue was exactly what you just laid out, which was we could do, you know, the most advanced um, protection uh, in, in the world. The reality was this, that the hackers, the, the, you know, the bad guys were always seemed to be one step ahead of whatever was available so it's like you know many many security companies back then the cyber security companies were focused on you know hiring hackers you know to help them figure out what was what was you know what was next and i and i think the intersection that's important to understand here is this is not about not worrying about any of that stuff no as a matter of fact that all needs to be top shelf that all needs to be in play or else you're not going to get cyber liability insurance in other words, you, you know, your, your insurance company now needs to know that you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's mm -hmm. on the IT side. And this is in addition to that, because guess what? As, as brilliant as your IT team may be and as advanced as they may be, they aren't as advanced as the next, you know, creative hacker or, or, or creative bad guy that's going to figure out some way into your systems. And there is the, the whole, as, as you mentioned, the word policy, um, and this, this is always the biggest security hole that I've ever seen, is the users, right? Mm -hmm. And back in the day, it used to be, you know, they're putting their passwords on post-it notes and sticking it up on their monitor, right? That's, a, that's an old school problem that of course you can't have now, but they, they may be accessing a system you know, across the internet and secure. And you don't know it if you don't have policies in play and you don't have the ability for your IT team to to, to, to then, you know, find that when it happens and, 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 and block that off as an example. So it's it's a bit of whack-a-mole when it comes when it comes sure. to, when it when it comes to the IT side. And so as they're whacking the moles that that, that are popping up, sooner or later one of them's gonna get up just long enough for somebody to get in and what you're talking about it's not it's not an if it's a win oh absolutely and so if it, and and so would you say that your role is to help prepare them it's not just getting the right insurance but in the process of getting the right insurance and, and the appropriate insurance it's figuring out what to do when something does eventually slip through the, slip through the cracks um and and, and how, yeah. to, how to be prepared to respond to that uh, how to be covered for that, obviously, um, but uh, you, how, how to get, how to mitigate the damage before it spreads, those types of things. Yeah, and um, I mean, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, um, business, the business side doesn't want to do, take the steps that they should be taking in terms of what to do if something happens. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It involves a lot of people who, again, are trying to run the business, grow the business, do whatever it takes to um, to generate revenue uh, and what have you. So a lot of times what you'll see is, is that cyber insurance is a cheat. Uh, they're not cheating. It's a cheat. Uh, essentially, they will do what is required of them based on the application. Uh, and so if the application does not ask, let me see a copy of your policies and procedures, 
then they don't have to worry about it. If, they, if it does ask, do you have policies and procedures in place? Well, then you don't lie. Uh, you say no uh, on that front. And a lot of times what you're seeing is, is that the business side will use the cyber insurance because pretty much all cyber insurance now has a breach response team built into the policy. And essentially that team is led by usually most often a lawyer so that you've created some attorney client privilege, but also within that team is our technical uh, resources are potentially negotiators if it's a ransomware um, situation. They're, the lawyer is a cyber lawyer who is familiar with potential regulatory or breach response uh, requirements that may have to be met depending on the state or states in which you might be um, under the auspices of and uh, are also familiar with the privacy laws now being enacted in various states like Virginia, California, uh, Utah, and there's a few others um, in that regard. So what will happen is, is essentially that breach response team will drive that business's response to the incident. So now the business doesn't have to put that all into place ahead of time because their thinking is I'm paying a premium to the insurance carrier. The insurance carrier is saying if they accept the claim that they will provide me this breach response team will help guide us through uh, this whole process. So that's what I mean. It's a bit of a cheat. It's a way for them to um, offlay not only some of the risk, uh, financial risk onto the insurance uh, carrier, but off, off lay the, um, some of the steps that have to be taken or some of the programs that might have to be built in terms of a response and let that breach response team take that. Now, again, I don't advocate that because I'll never tell you that a claim is guaranteed to be accepted. Um, what I will tell you is that my job is threefold. The first one is to find you a policy that covers the uh, most obvious, and in some cases, given my background, less obvious uh, risk or liability elements to your business. Mm. That is my very first job, is to make sure I can foresee in a reasonable fashion what your risk will be and that this policy will cover or have provisions to cover those risks. The second job I have, you know, or the brokerage as a whole has, is to make sure that the carrier that I recommend or we recommend or carriers, if I give you uh, multiple choices, uh, will be fair or has a history of being fair with the, the insureds when it comes to claim uh, processing. I don't want to have to give you a carrier that has a history of denying claims because you forgot to say yes on one of the questions on your application. And they didn't notice it when they approved your policy, but they noticed it after you filed the claim. And they said, oh, you didn't check this box, so claim denied. Right. Uh, I want to make sure that they're going to be fair with you so that you have the best possible um, strength or best possible uh, experience and that there is a greater than average, obviously, likelihood that they will accept the claim. And then the third piece is the premium. Obviously, we never want an insurance premium to drive you broke or to put you in a position of a financial hole. But that is that is my uh, that when you come to priority, that is third on my list may not be third on your list. But when it comes to it, my whole the whole job of an insurance broker is to make sure that we have a policy that covers you that by a carrier who will be fair to you in the claims process. And then we consider the premium. So what comes to mind for me, just as, as, as you're outlining that, Sean, and, and, and thank you for doing so, because I think so many times, especially with smaller businesses, even, even moving up into some smaller mid-sized businesses, as it were, um, their tendency is, oh, I need insurance. Let me go do a Google search. You know, uh, let, you know, let, let, let me, let me, uh, um, you know, it's we're coming at it from a, oftentimes you're coming at it from the perspective of 
what's the cheapest way I can, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I can check that off my list. Okay, yes, I've got, I've got cyber insurance. And I would only assume that there's lots of less than scrupulous uh, providers out there that would say, sure, we're happy to sell you an insurance policy for this lovely low rate. Um, and, you know, read the fine print and then basically they disclaim themselves out of any possibility of ever, ever honoring a claim. Um, and uh, I, I'm just sure that that, that that exists out there. But the, the opposite extreme and what a lot of those, those of us in smaller businesses, I think, need to realize is that at the enterprise level, at the, at the large, comp large company level, they know and get that they've got to cross these T's, dot these I's, research, understand, prepare for, plan for, et cetera, et cetera. They've, they've got to dedicate resources to it. They have to have an IT team that's that's on the ball. They have to have their policies and, and everything in place. But it looks like now that that has moved down into the small to mid-sized companies, much more so, especially in the last few years. Uh, than it ever has in the past. Mm -hmm. would, would that be accurate? Uh, definitely. Uh, the the industry is, especially cyber insurance right now, is one of the hardest policies to get. Uh, insurance carriers are afraid of it. They're afraid of the exposure that it, it presents to them and the unknowable amounts of money that they have lost because they weren't really understanding what they were covering. Uh, if you think about technology, it's almost impossible to put a parameter around it. I mean, I, I, a lot of people may or may not know this, but um, the reason, one of the reasons why you refer to a service that you connect through through an internet co connection as a cloud service provider is because when you're trying to graphically represent the internet you can't it's it's a it's a nebulous formless uh, ecosystem so you tend to use a cloud um, uh, in the graphical representation and so the marketing people actually got it right in terms of calling it cloud but back when i started i mean they were just starting to call it excuse me um, an ASP, an application service provider, mm -hmm. um, and which is no different from what the mainframes were doing way back in the beginning of IBM's days, except it, they're just doing it over a much larger geographic area. Well, that's the same thing that has happened with cyber insurance. When it first started out, the insurance carriers, they had really no idea because they weren't in technology. Uh, they were insurance carriers, so they were used, you have this product, you have this service, okay, my actuaries can take historical data, we can form a risk profile and say, okay, the premium of $1,000 is good if we spread it over a million businesses, we should be able to protect ourselves. Think of hurricanes or shipping or anything that has a long history of, of da data. Well. They didn't really have that when they started producing cyber insurance uh, policies. And then as the data started to roll in, the thing with technology is what happened today is going to be different from tomorrow, simply because the technology is tweaked just enough that it's just different enough um, in that regard. So every time they would get data, they would say, OK, we've got it pegged. We're still good. But really what had happened was the data had changed. It was no longer black. It had moved to a shade of gray. Um, and then it moved to a shade of green and then red and, and so on and so forth. So now the carriers have started to understand we have to have a better concept of what is really happening within these, these businesses. And so they have started asking better questions. They still don't ask what I would consider the right questions, but they are asking much better questions. They are requiring much better uh, security documentation, like multi-factor authentication. If you don't have multi-factor authentication across everything, you're not getting cyber insurance today. Um, so they're tightening the parameters by which they will say yes. And that's, where my background makes me a bit of a unicorn in the industry in that I come from the technology space into the insurance space. 
I'm not somebody who's been in the insurance space and I'm trying to figure out technology, which I'll be honest, and except for some rare individuals, you're not going to do it. Uh, there's just no way to learn technology from this side, from this distance. You got to be right there. Um, and so when somebody goes and they answer, do you have end-to-end -end encryption? And they automatically check it off. And I've talked to them on the phone. I said, man, do you even understand what end-to-end -end encryption means? Um, do you, do you, are you sure you've got it? And they say, yeah, 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 yeah. Our IT guys said we have our data is encrypted. I said, okay, your data is encrypted, but that doesn't mean you have end to end encryption. Well, what's the difference? How about this? Instead of me trying to explain it to you, just give me your IT folks and let me talk to them. Let me go through the application with them, confirm all this information, and then we'll know that what is in your environment is properly reflected on this application. Um, because when you do file a claim, an insurance carrier, one of the first places they're going to go look is at the application. And if what they see on the application doesn't match what they see on the claim, then they have grounds to potentially deny the claim uh, for legitimate reasons. So my, again, my goal is to be able to make sure that you're in a position to where that does not happen, or I make it as difficult as possible for the carrier to make that happen or to do that to you. And one of those areas is because I know when you say I have this, I I can question it. Um, I mean, I have one going on right now that will happen after this this interview is that I'm reviewing an application that they, they've said some contradictory, they've answered some questions that are contradictory. And so I have to have a call with their IT folks because it just it doesn't make sense to me but somebody without my technical background they probably wouldn't understand why i think those are contradictory answers and they would just accept okay you've answered the, the questions i assume you've done it truthfully i'm going to submit it and then potentially down the road those answers those contradictory answers might come back to bite the the insured and so the net results of them producing an application like that if you weren't able to intercede and be able to predict as you said to, to be able to look for the contradictions right so they're either going to be denied the, the the insurance in the first place because you know the insurance company has their act together enough to know that there's there's contradictory answers or they may be accepted and they may pay the premium and get and get under the program but then what's going to happen later is when that cyber event happens and they mm -hmm. need to, 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 to get that, to have that policy quote pay out uh, and, or, you know, bring in a team to help protect them and help them feel, uh, deal with what's happened. Uh, the insurance company is going to say, well, but you had these contradictory answers yeah. on, on your thing. And so we know now that, you didn't have end to end. Yes, you had some encrypted data, but you didn't have end to end encryption. So thereby, you know, read the fine print. We can't honor this claim. All right. Correct. And so, and so what what you're doing is is you're actually protecting the client from either from from either or either being denied the, right. the, the opportunity to to, to to get the policy or getting the policy but not having it enforceable because you made a mistake. The data is not correct. Yeah, exactly. So absolutely yeah. brilliant. So I'd much rather, I'd be honest with you, I'd much rather have a prospect denied coverage than the coverage be accepted. And then down the road, the claim gets denied because of something on the application. Um, yeah, because they put they put all this money and all this time and all this correct. energy into it. And, and it was all basically at that point for not because. Right. That, yep. And they had a false sense of having an umbrella uh, over their heads. So outstanding so if i may i just wanted to take a, a a minute to explain who we are what we do uh here with practice marketing incorporated which is video socials.net um phone blogger.net and our video socials vip service uh and then when i come back uh to that sean i'm going to ask you one more question uh at at, at the end a little, little, little bit of uh something i think will be a great takeaway uh, for those that are watching this so 
Um, I'm the co-founder of Mark Bullock, the co-founder of VideoSocials.net, but also uh, Video Socials was really a uh, a second step after what we created more than a decade ago, which was PhoneBlogger.net. And PhoneBlogger.net was a concept of trying to get our subject matter, matter experts like Sean, who are consultants, attorneys, CPAs, et cetera, et cetera, to actually create content. And they would sit down and write their blog posts, et cetera, and they take hours and hours. And okay, look, that's just not working. Let's call them, interview them five, 10 minutes, have a professional editor, then edit that content and uh, get, have them approve it and then go and then get it out there handling all the social media technology newsletters all, all that kind of stuff for them video socials came around because video is basically if you haven't figured it out yet taking over the internet especially in the social media space so that being said we needed to find a way for people to get their short video blogs as we call them their short video content and get comfortable and confident on camera learn how to hone their messages learn how to have a conversation with their audience. And so we created videosocials.net in, in, in the case, in, in the simplest form is we have a Zoom meeting, five to eight people will, will, will come in and we'll all take turns recording our, our videos, one take, two, three minute videos, and then giving each other feedback on what worked really well, what you know might might could use some improvement for next time around, and and give some pointers as, as additional topics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really works brilliantly. And Sean, thank you for being a, a longtime client mm -hmm. and, and one of our early clients to that process, and and, and, and a tr tremendously valuable member of that. Um, and then now, uh, of course, people want to get into longer form content. They want to create video podcasts. They want to create audio podcasts, et, et cetera. So. And that's a fairly complex world, and it's and it's a it's a it's it, it's a place that many of our quote subject matter experts don't have a lot of experience with, and don't have the time to sit there and deal with all of the invites and and, and getting guests and and, and and dealing with the technology of, of setting up or, and or trying to do live streams, et cetera, et cetera, on their own and dealing with the chat while they're while they're trying to run the technology while they're trying to interview a guest, et cetera, et cetera, and then what to do with it when it when it's all said and done. So our VIP service is designed for that as well. So it's phoneblogger.net if you're doing written blog posts or would like some help with that. It's videosocials.net and then click on the guest tab. We'd love to have you as a guest uh, uh, to come to that if you're if you're just getting started uh, in video or you want that platform to give you that weekly meeting so that it gets done. And then if you are interested or you've already started and would like some help with uh, podcasting, video podcasting, live streams, et cetera, et cetera, that's videosocial.vip. And with that said, Sean, I wanted to, to, to come back to, it's an immense topic, everything that you just talked about. And I know that we're just literally skimming the surface, but what's the one thing that you want business owners to know if they don't currently have cyber liability insurance but are starting to get a clue that they need it um what what do they need to know where do they need to start so um well two points i i think not every business needs cyber insurance but we're at 80 to 90 percent of businesses now need cyber insurance simply because of data privacy rules that are popping up uh, among the states uh, potentially under uh, you might have some federal uh, or industry regulations that you might have to meet and if you have potentially any customers who are eu citizens uh, you have gdpr uh, to deal with uh, which is the big uh, data privacy that covers EU citizens. So that's the, the first one. You have to assume that you, you need it. Uh, and the second point is you're not too small and it's no longer a matter that you don't have anything that people want. Uh, you may have an incident just by mistake. You may get caught up because somebody has sent out a billion phishing emails today and one of your employees uh, has clicked on a link that 
they shouldn't have. And it produces a ransomware attack or all of a sudden they fall for a business email compromise scam or something along those lines. And so in that event, you will be left to pay uh, on your own with your own money if you don't have cyber insurance because none of the other insurances are really going to cover that. Even a crime policy now has further limitations when it comes to crime committed through uh, a cyber network. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of the, the crime policies that I've begun to see are starting to trim out that cyber or that computer fraud, what they used to call computer fraud piece of it. And in which case then you could be left exposed and all you have to do is just look at the last five years. It is getting more and more and more expensive to recover from a cyber incident and really deal with the long tail, years long tail that might be involved. Because if you have anything like a civil suit or a regulatory uh, action brought against you, those last a long time, take a lot of legal time. Uh, and lawyers are not cheap in any regard in this instance and could have a deterioration effect on your finances to the point where you can't survive uh, because you have to pay this all out of pocket so i tell people look i understand it's a hate love relationship with insurance you hate paying the premiums for something you, you think you won't be using but you love it when it covers a claim and so cyber insurance should be part of the majority of businesses uh, insurance portfolio now, right up there with general liability, property, errors and omissions and all and malpractice and all the other insurances that, that most people have heard of. Uh, cyber should be part of that that program now. So I'm going to say the place to start is to contact you. Um, I would love that. <laughs> I'm always happy to chat as I end all my videos. And uh, uh, and if you're not ready to pick up the phone and call Sean to have a conversation, Sean, where is all of this wonderful free content that you've put out there? Um, so it's all you saw on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, that is where all my videos go. Uh, and any other uh, information, I'm constantly reading certain things. And that's why a lot of people say I scare them because I'm not posting that, hey, look, a new flower garden, uh, community flower garden went up. No, I'm putting up, oh, look, somebody else was just hacked and lost a million dollars. Uh, I'm trying to make people aware that this is a, this is now a business. Cybercrime is a business. It is a massive business. Um, it is multi-billion dollars worth of business on a yearly basis. And a business that size uh, requires constant uh, vigilance on your part. And so I'm always posting where I think people aren't being vigilant, or they are, um, and, but just happen to get caught in, in some sort of wash. And, and uh, luckily, cyber insurance has become more and more uh, accepted by a lot of businesses. And there are a lot of instances where uh, businesses have been saved by having that insurance. So if you go to my LinkedIn profile, check out my posts, you'll see all the videos there. Usually I, I do one a week uh, through video socials. Uh, it's been, I think I just did my 114th uh, through video socials. So there's a lot of content there. You do not have to watch it all at one time, um, but uh, every once in a while, just go check it out. Uh, and hopefully you learn something new each time. And you know, follow and or subscribe, et, et, et cetera. So uh, there'll be links below for for your uh, for your profile and your and your website as well. So uh, that will be associated with this. So, Sean, um, you know, as as a, as a fellow geek, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I just I just love this stuff, and um, uh, and it scares me just as much as it scares it scares anybody else. Um, but um, you know, I think that the light at the end of the tunnel is, is this, there's a select few of people like you that truly do understand the tech side and the insurance side mm -hmm. and the business side and, and how, that, how, how that intersects. So I invite anyone viewing this, please do check out Sean's LinkedIn profile and 
perhaps be willing to have a conversation um, so that uh, it can take some of the scariness away by what would be appropriate to, to help mitigate those risks that right i'm only scary in the videos not when we talk <laughs> john thank you again it was wonderful having this conversation and thank you uh, and and uh, um, really i appreciate the fact that what you do makes a difference for the individuals the business owners the employees etc of these companies that are just trying to operate their business and protect themselves in the in, in the process and yeah. uh, and and how your knowledge and experience can really assist them and, and and help smooth out that process a little bit take care buddy thank you mark you as well i'll see you on friday all right take care guys